I'm Trevor Cummings, and these are my thoughts on money. Hello, and welcome to the Thoughts on Money podcast, what we like to call Tom. I'm Trevor Cummings, your host of the podcast, sometimes the author of the blog, not today. Uh, today was an article called Financial Milestones by none other than Mr. Blaine Garver. Good morning. Thanks for having me. Sean Latimer's here with us. Hello, hello. Why are you looking at Blaine like that? No, I was... I didn't know if we're going to clap or do like, a, yeah, <laughs> cheering for Blaine. We I need that know. applause that you were we talking about. We need the board the for all my humor and everything. We need one of those sound boards where we can like put like sound effects and stuff. Yep. This sound, get that on order. This sounds amazing. <laughs> uh, I liked your article today because it's something I never thought about. I never thought about how many, uh, you know, like we, we're familiar when you turn 25, you can rent a car. car, car oh, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, rent a car. Turn 21, you could. Drink your beer. <laughs> Turn 18, you can vote, right? Yeah. So we're so used to these milestones, and all of us have young kids, so there's different milestones. Like uh, my little boy just started kindergarten, and mm-hmm. they have uh, something on the wall where every time one of the kids loses a tooth, they write their name and they put it on the tooth on the calendar. And i got to think that thing is going to be just loaded because at that age, they're losing teeth every week. Oh, yeah. So, uh, yeah, the milestones is a very fun way to look at finance. But also, even though it's fun, also a good reminder for people of what should I be focused on for this stage of life or for my kids or grandkids, Mm -hmm. because you can teach finance at quite a young age. Yeah. The idea is that we're going from, you know, a hypothetical person from age zero to 100. And there's all these different age milestones where it maybe provides new privileges or responsibilities or decisions. Uh, You know, age 59 and a half, you can take a retirement withdrawal without a penalty, things like that. But also there's these stage of life uh, and in these decades where there's just certain things that you really need to hone in on um, and different strategies to consider, right? If you're in your 20s, you're going to consider something else, something different than um, somebody in their 60s would consider. It's a very random question, but I want to hear your guys' answers. Sean Latimer, how, what age are you going to live to? I have no idea. (laughs) You have to answer. I I hope I live a long, full, healthy life, but I have no idea what that looks like. (laughs) For some reason in my mind, I was just like, I'm going to live to 100. It can't be that hard, right? But uh, gosh, so it's so rare. Sean and I read a book on longevity, and I don't know what they call them, centenarians. I think Mm -hmm. that's what they call them. And it's such a small percentage, but for some reason, we all operate with this level of confidence of immortality. Um, It's interesting. When you said zero to 100, I'm like, I hope so. (laughs) Yeah, I hope so too. So we can start in the early days. Right, so age zero, there's actually something you can do. You can open an UPMA account, which is called the Uniform Transfers um, for to Minors Act account. That's a mouthful. Yeah. Uh, and, or UGMA. Or UGMA a to make it more gift <laughs> to minor account to make it more complicated. Um, or you can open a 529 as long as the child has a social. I believe is the uh, requirement. But um, it's a great way to compound investments literally before you can walk and talk. Obviously, you're going to have to open it up for that minor. But I'm curious for you guys, I'm, I'm sure you've got a, a lot of clients uh, on this decision, you know, whether to do a, a, a UTMA or a 529. What are some of those considerations for you guys? You know, it's interesting because a lot of times education is important to parents for their kids. And so they uh, think 529. Mm-hmm. But once they start saving and funding uh, a 529 account and they're thinking like, OK, where do they think they'll go to school and that's 18 years away and they start to wonder you never know and then you think of how expensive college is and if it continues to compound the way it is now the expense you you start to wonder like uh, is it going to be a hundred thousand dollars a year everywhere or is there going to be some sort of disruption where there's other options of school Mm -hmm. and then you the biggest concern for 529s is people didn't want to oversave in them because there wasn't really a great option. Yeah, yes, you could change the beneficiary to another child, or maybe you hold on to it forever and, and you help a, a niece or nephew or future grandchildren. Like that, that's always an option. Some people just bite the bullet and take the money out and pay the penalty and taxes on the gains. Uh, but then recently, the rules changed again mm-hmm. that you can actually fund a Roth IRA for that beneficiary. And you guys. Tell me if I'm right. As long as it's in place for more than 10 years, I, I think believe. it's 15 even maybe. Or 15 yeah, years. a long time. And then I think the max is 35000 you can do. And you mm-hmm. do normal Roth IRA contributions each year. And so 
that makes it a little bit more enticing that you're thinking, okay, if they don't use all of it, at least it's not a, you know, use it or lose it scenario. Yeah. The only hard part about that is there's so many rules to that. Like you, mm. I don't know them exactly, but you said it's like 15 years. <laughs> you have to have a 529. Then they have to actually qualify to contribute to Roth. So they have to have the yep. earned income. Uh, or if they earn too much income, then they, they don't qualify. Yep. So uh, it makes a pretty tight lane of, of who can use it. Yeah. I will say for me, I'm not a huge fan. I, I'm going to add some color to this, but I'm not a huge fan of the UTMA mm-hmm. because at that age of majority, uh, we're in California. I think you can punt it all the way to 25, 25 right? Yeah. yeah. But at the age of majority, it's their money. Yes. So... I just think uh, you don't know what a, a zero-year-old or a one-year-old <laughs> is going to turn out like, so it might not be in their best interest to get a lump sum of money at that future date. Yeah, I like the 529s from an estate planning standpoint because it gets it out of your estate, mm-hmm. and I do like the idea of like a lifetime education pension, passing it down to grandkids and stuff like that, but I also think people have to be careful because we're what I've seen, people get in the mode of how much can I put in that thing? And I'm like, well, for a 529, you could super fund it. Mm-hmm. So you can take that uh, gift tax exemption. That's, uh, what is it, $18,000 now? Mm-hmm. So you and your spouse can each give one person $36,000 times five. So you can put $180,000 all at once. It's not always the best decision, right? Yeah. It creates some illiquidity for our listeners. I'm just saying that that money is not easily accessible without taxes and penalty once you make that decision. So I know Sean has funded 529s for his kids. I have, but both of us have kind of, we've done good funding for young ages, Mm -hmm. but we're not trying to do maximum funding because there's some limitations we can create. And one thing you mentioned, like the setting up like a forever foundation for your family that and getting out of your state, those are great planning items if there are a lot of leftovers. Um, mm-hmm. The last thing you want to do is overfund a 529 if you think you might need that money to live, you know, yeah. because like Trevor said, it's not uh, easily accessed. Yeah. Yeah. There's uh, somebody I know that actually funded a 529, their grandparent. They funded it, put themselves as beneficiary with the idea that they will distribute to their grandkids whenever they be kind of come of age, if you will. And so because, Sean, you mentioned the rule with 529s, you can actually change the beneficiary. Um, they've kind of created this legacy 529. They don't know exactly who it's going to yet, but they'll you know parse it off to their grandkids over time. I think that's great. If someone has leftovers on 529 and maybe they can't contribute to the Roth IRA for whatever reason and they don't necessarily need the money and there's you know they know there will be nieces and nephews and other people that need help in school and they look at it like, well, this is great. We can use a portion of it for them. Yes, you can change the beneficiary whenever you want. Uh, I remember hearing a funny story where someone had a, a lot of leftovers on 529 and uh grandma and grandpa changed the beneficiary to them and then took cooking classes at a local university. <laughs> and then uh, I think they actually went on like a trip with this class somewhere in it. And I was like, oh, that's kind of fun. <laughs> so yeah, there, there's some creative ways to use that money. Grandma and grandpa studied abroad. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Never yeah. Up for any classes. <laughs> they didn't go to any of the cooking classes. <laughs> I just, love it. <laughs> yeah, I wish I remembered all the details uh, at a firm I used to work at. They had uh, a few attorneys come in and they did this whole presentation on using 529s for estate planning reasons. And it was just like all 10 grandkids maxed out to get out of the estate and then letting the kids take it out for non uh college expenses but at their tax rates versus mm. so uh yeah there's some goofy things people can do with tax loopholes and things of that nature but yeah from my experience i i will say i do have a client that recently opened an utma and i loved his reason and his posture for doing it uh, he wanted to teach his daughter about investing yep so she was saving some extra money she opened the utma and then i did some meetings with her to tell her about the underlying investments how they worked how compounding works mm-hmm. so uh, i think you can use it it just it's nice when you know it's a responsible person that's going to be able to to take that money at some future date because yeah. remember with an atma i don't remember the terminology they use but i would be acting as the custodian i think the word is for you my, as the parent you're exactly saying. yeah at, for my kids yep. and then i then am a fiduciary mm-hmm. so i can't say hey 
You know what your punishment is, little boy? Like, I'm taking this out. I, as a fiduciary, I can't do that. I have to act in the best interest of the beneficiary. So Maybe it is in the best interest. Of the <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. Mom and dad wanted to go to a Laker game. Yeah. Shepherd's Street. And you're Street, grounded. Exactly, and you're grounded. So, yeah, a lot to do when, when yeah. kids are born. And what a fun thing for grandparents to do when that first grandkid's born and they're like, Oh, like what a great first gift to mom and dad. Like I funded their college account uh, already and we know how compounding works. Imagine how many, the impact 18 years can have with large funding at age zero. Yeah. And I'm with you, Trevor. I I like Utma's as a kind of a teaching, a training uh, mechanism. Yes, the money's going to compound, but if you're not putting a whole lot of money in there, it's more of a teaching opportunity for that, that child. And it's cool for the child to see their name on something and to see that money grow. And now more than ever, you have to teach because now there's these stock trading applications mm-hmm. that are like Candy Crush. You know what I mean? <laughs> like I see kids like, oh, I just bought some Bitcoin or, you know, the airlines are down and I'm going to buy this. And I've had friends talk about that. And like yeah. when you buy it on the app, it like confetti is like, <laughs> and it's like, yeah, you probably should teach somebody how investing works or else they're going to go the route of gambling quite quickly. Yeah, Absolutely. We'll cruise on to what I'm calling adulthood, which is a broad range in in this article. I'm saying it's basically from 25 to age 50. There's not really any specific age milestones. I know a lot of 25 year olds that aren't adults, though. That's very true, especially (laughs) these days. (laughs) Um, So as far as what I'll call adulthood, um, because there's no particular age milestones, a couple things come about. Um, If you're a parent, you might be eligible for the child tax credit. Just kind of nice, unexpected. Who uh, has tax eleven break. kids? You have a friend with eleven kids. I do have a friend with eleven kids. Not adopted. Uh, four adopted, seven biological. Wow. <laughs> so you can do the math on that for the child tax credit. I think there's some limitations there. I but... can never hang out with that person because I <laughs> complain about how hard it yeah. is juggling three kids. Oh, me too. Yeah. <laughs> so, so the child tax credit, and then. Uh, some things with uh, social security disability benefit, you become eligible after about 10 years of full-time work, some nuances there, but a couple things that are really important in these, this like early adulthood stage, um, I think term life and or disability insurance, and then building the savings habits. So Trevor, I know you're passionate about, uh, insurance in these early ages. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah, I'm going to correct that sentence because I'm anti-passionate about insurance. I'm sure. Kidding. No, uh, I'm critical of insurance, very critical, mm-hmm. when I see it used as a vehicle for everything. Right. Right? Like, mm-hmm. oh, you want to go to college one day? No, not a 529, a whole life policy. Or you want to retire one day? Whole life policy, <laughs> right? It's like Oprah Winfrey, like, you get a whole life policy, you get a whole life policy. <laughs> yeah. So I don't love it in that sense, but I am passionate, you're right, that in this what you're calling adulthood stage for Mm -hmm. people, I'm just going to be aggressive about it. If you're the breadwinner in the family, you have to have life insurance. It's not super expensive. I can't think of a case when you wouldn't have it because if if you don't, then somebody else has to be the safety net. Mm -hmm. Your in-laws have to be the safety net. The church has to be the safety net. Uh, Tomorrow's not promised. So if your family is dependent on your income, there needs to be a replacement of your income. Uh, God forbid something has happened to you. Mm -hmm. And I actually feel the same way, even though there's less engagement around disability insurance. But I've said this on the podcast before. I had a neighbor, a good friend, amazing human being. He he passed away. But before he passed, he got hit by a drunk driver on Super Bowl Sunday, I think in 2012 or something. For five years, or I don't know the timing, uh, he was in a wheelchair and, and he wasn't really capable of doing much. And he was the breadwinner in his family. So a life insurance policy doesn't pay on that. And I, I, I do mentor young people and oversee second generation for clients, and I'm always telling them, like, the advisor has to present life insurance and disability insurance. If you don't want to do it, that's up to you. Uh, you know, I sometimes quote this verse from Ezekiel that says, like, if the watchman in the tower says that the enemy's coming and you do nothing about it, the blood's not on my hands. So it's a little bit of a, a drastic way to say it, but I am... Uh, I, Ignorance is not bliss in that in that sense. So mm-hmm. a little long winded, but I think for adulthood, you're exactly right. When your balance sheet doesn't support being self insured, you need to fill the gaps with the appropriate insurance. Yeah, yeah. And we're talking about if you have dependents, so a spouse and or in our children. Uh, and statistically speaking, disability 
is more common in this age group than death. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. What so are, do you know the stats? Um, ask Sarah Leitsky, okay. our director of risk. <laughs> that, was, that was such a Trevor moment right there. Oh, yeah, cite your source. Let's hear the yeah, stats. Yeah, cite your source. <laughs> no, and then he did a total right. TVG move. He's like, actually, Trevor, we have a department for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah that was smart. That was very smart. Um, stat of the day, stat of the day. Yeah. You so, know, you know what's interesting, Blaine? I was looking at the second topic, the mm-hmm. savings habits. And you know when you're raising little kids, they say, like, it goes really fast. And you're like, yeah. I know, but I'm not sleeping right now, so I wish it would go a little bit faster, right? <laughs> but uh, now that my oldest just turned 10, and I'm like, oh, man, I'm like halfway done. Like, he's wow. he's going to be gone when he's 18, probably sooner, as soon as he gets a license. <laughs> yeah. Or he's going to be ring and be there forever. Yeah, it's true. Uh, but I thought about on saving, because when you have little kids, and you're kind of uh, maybe growing in your career and your savings, and you kind of feel like you have plenty of time. Plenty of time, right? They're little kids. And then next thing you know, it's like, no, it's going by way faster than you thought, which is sad because they're not little kids anymore. But then you're also running out of time where the, the, the impact of that savings is less. Yeah. It doesn't really help to save a bunch of money when they're in high school if you're saving for college, mm-hmm. right? Because you're not giving yourself a lot of time for that to compound. So uh, yeah, I think it's important that you, you put that in there, that it's a, it's a habit. You, you need to start mm-hmm. early. Yeah. One of my friends, I forget what he says. I think he says the nights are long, but the years are short. So I've heard a few like that. They say the days are long or the, or the days go by slow, but the years go by fast or something like yeah. that. Uh, okay. Yeah, I have another friend too. This one, this paradigm is always like, oh, don't say that. His his son, I think, is 12, and he'll say like, oh, we only have six summers left. Oh, and I'm like, oh, oh yeah. golly, don't, don't count things that are low numbers and I count on one hand. I, I've seen like a graph paper, and Sean, you were mentioning, you know, you have 18 years maybe with your with your child and you're 10 of the way there. So you basically like fill out one of those little squares for every day, or you could, you know, do a, uh, a row for every year. And like visually seeing it, in your case, you're more than halfway done. I think it's pretty eye-opening when you actually see that visually. It's even more, too. There was some stat, and it talked about, like... Well, I set your source. <laughs> it was, like, Instagram. It wasn't a good source. but it, Wikipedia. It, it said that um, you spend, like, I think it was, like, 70 or 80% of the time that you're going to spend with your children is, like, before the age 17. And, and it kind of makes sense, because once they go off to college or, you know, they get married, you, if you saw your kids, like, once a week or on a weekend or something, that's a lot, you know? Like, I have a lot of friends, their parents live out of state. They see them maybe once or twice a year. Mm. And I'm always like, oh, man. So, yeah. I think I say you spend seventy or eighty percent of your time telling your kids no. Oh, that's, <laughs> that's, 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 that's me. I, we've been talking about this, and we'll get back on topic. My wife, there's a couple of things I've let the the kids do recently. She's like, "Why are you doing that?" I'm like, "I'm trying really hard to say yes to more things because I say no yeah. so much." So last night she had a board meeting. Uh, she's on the board at the Boys and Girls Club, and she came home and she's like, "Did you guys go in the pool?" I'm like, "Yeah." Judah asked if we could go in the pool at like six six thirty at night, like right before bedtime. I'm like. Yes. <laughs> so, <laughs> was a yes man these days. Exactly. I'm holding little Ruthie. Uh, you know, she's whatever, 20 months old, trying to get her, like, she's in the jacuzzi. I'm, like, trying to get her to not jump in. And she just, like, does a Mr. Magoo walk all the time and drops in. I'm like, are you going to learn? So, yeah, it's uh, it's hard to say yes. But I, I probably say no 60 to 80% of the time. <laughs> Makes sense. Well, to wrap up the early adulthood, the common thread here is really building that solid foundation. So protecting your family if you have dependents and then building those savings habits. It's not like there's a lot of time for your investments to compound. Let's say if you're in your early 20s and you're just getting started working, but building those savings habits is important because we often talk about lifestyle creep, this idea of- What a creep. What a creep. As your income goes up, a lot of people's expenses also go up. And so their savings rate doesn't really change. But if you build those savings habits early, it's going to be huge for you in your 40s, 50s, 60s. I invite lifestyle creep. How about you? Yeah. I, He's hesitating. I think my perspective <laughs> has changed a lot because, um, and we've talked about this recently. That well, you only have eight summers left. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. I, I definitely have a little bit of the live in the moment. So it's pretty easy to convince me like, well, you only tomorrow's not guaranteed. YOLO. Why not? You know, but at the same, Carpe diem. <laughs> the same breath, you know, you you don't want to uh, – oh, I heard something really funny. I'll tell you guys a funny story. I was going to say you don't want to be, like, living in a van, you know, in retirement. But uh, the funny thing I heard is that before they say, hey, if you don't say work hard in school or get a good job and save money, you might live in a van by the river. But now it's if you save a lot of money, you might get to live 
in a van by the, the river. Bougie Those cool van. <laughs> sprinter vans. And I was like, oh, that's so true. These things are $150,000. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. You'd be crazy. lucky to have one. <laughs> Uh, one of our coworkers, uh, I've known her husband since he was a little boy, and uh, I remember he came back from college, and I saw him, and I'm like, hey, where do you live? And he's like, oh, I moved back in with the high school roomies, and I'm like, your parents? <laughs> and he's like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> well, uh, we'll we'll turn it over to what I call pre-retirement, and in this case, it's really just your 50s, um, and there, there are a few age milestones at this point. So age 50, if you turn 50 in the calendar year, you can start to fund more into your employer 401k or 403b. You can actually uh, fund an additional 7,500 a year. And then you what can, a shaming name that they give though. Catch, catch up. up. Oh, <laughs> like catch you, up for a reason. You're, yeah. behind, you're, behind. <laughs> you're behind. You're behind. Exactly. You save a little bit more. You've got to catch up. Exactly. So, and then an extra thousand dollars to traditional or Roth IRA, uh, if you're eligible for those, uh, at age 55, Certain individuals might be eligible for penalty-free withdrawals from their employer plan. Is that a 72T or is that something different? Something different. Okay. So in this case, like if you're, um, if you're with your employer through age 55, you retire, instead of rolling over the 401k to an IRA, maybe you keep it in the 401k. You can actually pull money out uh, of that 401k. You're still gonna pay taxes on it because that's a pre-tax source but you can avoid um, the, the 10% penalty that would normally apply with an IRA. That's not 72T? I think 72T is a systematic That's what I was thinking, but Correct. how do you do it at 55? I Teach think, me. Uh, you can take lump sum withdrawals. Oh. You have to qualify. I think they give you be one-offs, not systematic. Yes. Okay. Correct. Yeah. yeah. But there's probably the same thing. Same, glad I, same I, idea. I'm glad I came to this podcast. Yeah. Same <laughs> idea. <laughs> we're, all, we're all learning. Yeah. So yeah, 72T, more systematic. Yeah. The age 55, I don't know the exact, exact term, but it, you can I do, hope you didn't make it up because I, uh, I, I, I was kind <laughs> of on your side. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so there's that. And then uh, at age 59 and a half, most people are aware of this. By the way, why is it 59 and a half? Why is it's it not 50 59 or 60? Do you guys know? I don't know. Nah, I don't know. And it, you, what... What, what did the old RMD? Was the old RMD It was 70, 70 and, and a half, half, but now they That's made right. it 72, 73, right? Yep. They no, probably seven, no, they 73, and then it'll be... Oh, no, but there's wait. no half there anymore. No, 73 no, to 75 now. 75 if yeah. you're after 2033. Maybe they realize that. Nobody listening is, cares about yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> Anyways, what 59 and a half represents in this case is if you have money in an IRA, uh, you can pull, pull money. It's going to be taxable but it's penalty free. So free of that 10% penalty. So that's important for a lot of people that are retiring. It's kind of that magic number. And what's interesting, you have to be, it has to be actually, actually the day of your half birthday. <laughs> so if you pull it a day early, you're going to get the 10% penalty. So be aware of that. You guys don't celebrate your half, half birthday, do you? You don't even know what date it is. No, I don't think so. My okay. sister-in-law does because oh, her, her birthday is on Christmas. So I feel like that's one of the very few exceptions. Cause she's, she's so her not, half birthday is my son's birthday. June twenty fifth. Yeah, they celebrate oh, together. There you go. So I don't. I don't. I think it's hard to celebrate a birthday when everybody else is celebrating Christmas. Mm. So that's probably the reason. Maybe maybe yeah. it's her husband celebrates the birthday more than her. I don't. I don't know. Fair enough. <laughs> Jesus takes all the attention. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so yeah, the fifties I would say is really crunch time, and like you were saying, Trevor, the the IRS even calls it a catch up contribution, and so. Are you taking advantage of the additional uh, retirement accounts available to you? It's interesting, and we can fly through it a little faster Mm because I would encourage our readers to look at the the written. But you went like, see you at 18, 25 to 50. But then there's all these age things that happen. You have 50, 55, 59 and a half, 60, 62, 65, Mm -hmm. 66 to 67, 70, 70 and a half, 73 to 75. Like this is... This is prime time oh, yeah. for somebody in their prime time. <laughs> yeah, from 50 to 73, there's there's an almost every other year, there's an important financial milestone. So whether you're approaching that or you have family or friends, it's good to be aware of. 50 is the new 40. <laughs> <laughs> You'll keep changing as you get yeah, older. Yeah, exactly. Um, I'll, I'll zoom into the 60s. So I, I title it an article, Retirement, Social Security, and Medicare. And bottom line, it's very complex. There's a lot of rules around Social Security, around Medicare, around retirement distribution rules. And so talk to a professional. That's that's my number one piece of advice. But as far as the specific ages, 
age 60. If you happen to be a widow, uh, you'll be eligible for the Social Security Survivors Benefit, which is a couple of years earlier than you normally can pull Social Security, which is at age 62. Um, now, want to be careful to not go too in depth on all the Social Security rules, but it's important to know what's called your FRA or full retirement age ben um, benefit. So for most people, it's well, for all people, it's either age 66, age 67, or somewhere in between. And on your Social Security statement, it'll tell you what your projected benefit is. All the other benefits are based off of that. Either a discount or premium to that. Exactly. So if you wait until after full retirement age, you get more. If you do it before full retirement age, you get a haircut. Exactly right. Is the sliding scale like 8% per year? I think it depends. Does it depend yeah. though when you're when your full retirement age is, they yeah. do some crazy math. It's like one eight. I, I'm yes. not going to get into it because nobody wants to listen <laughs> to it and I actually don't know. Yeah. Very complex. It, uh, so after your full retirement age, it is 8% per year. So if you wait after age 67, you're going to gain 8% per year. Yeah. Before your full retirement age, it varies. Got it. <laughs> and okay. that's all I'll say. Okay. <laughs> and I know people talk a lot about break even points and, but sometimes that doesn't, for me, that doesn't always do it for me. Mm -hmm. So when, when, when we say you're going to get 8% more, this is true, but you're also not going to get the monthly payments for every year that you would get the 8% more in the future. Absolutely. So th the way I like to think about it is like like when I let my boys race, right? My, my five-year-old is a lot faster than my four-year-old. So when they race, I let my four-year-old go first, and I count like three seconds, and then I let my mm -hmm. five-year-old go. So for a little while, my four-year-old is going to be in front yeah. uh, until – that break-even point where the the extra speed makes up for it. So we do talk to people that the break-even point in Social Security sometimes can be in your mid to late 70s. So there could be an argument that the utility of that money, the use case, right? I don't remember what they call them. Like they call them your go-go years and then your no-go years. There's a term. Go-go, slow-go, and then no-go. Yeah, go-go, yeah. slow-go, and then no-go. So maybe it's better used in your go-go years. I'm yeah. more saying that it's not just a math equation, right? There's yeah. preference. There's some, some qualitative factors that should definitely be considered. And yeah. for the record, I won't cite my source because I don't know the number, but I, I'm pretty sure the the age that most people, meaning like the statistically highest number, claim at, I think it is 62. You're right. I think it's mm -hmm. like over 30% of Americans claim at that age yeah. or something like that. So. Well, part of it is that there's like somewhat of a, I don't want to call it a crisis, but like a retirement crisis. A mm -hmm. majority of the population didn't really save for retirement. Mm -hmm. So they probably found themselves either need that money. And then, like you said, there's some qualitative reasoning, like maybe they don't think it'll be funded in the future. So they're mm -hmm. going to take it while it's available. And uh, there's a lot of things to consider. It's a longevity bet, too. If you yeah. look at your own genes and um, you don't have longevity in your genes, then the claiming early is actually wise. Um, and, and also... If the thing that you know animates you the most is trying to extract the most money out of the Social Security Department, um, right on. It's probably <laughs> not. It, me and you are very different. Yeah. So during the 60s, something else important is tax planning. And generally, if you're, let's say you're in your 50s, you're working. The tax planning is typically stuff as much money as you can into tax deferred or tax free accounts. That's th there's more to it, but that's the general idea. Oh, I'm going to say one thing just real yes. quick. And I know we're going a little long, so I'll make up for this, Sean. Well, we'll skip some other things. <laughs> so the only critique I have there, I, I think people have gotten so much in the mode of just doing a 401k, mm -hmm. right? I think there's a lot of situations I come across where the Roth 401k is better. And let me, let me mm -hmm. tell you why. Like I deal with a lot of second generation clients and I'm telling them, hey, I actually know what you're going to inherit. I'm not going to yeah. tell you yet because mom and dad told me not to tell you yet. But for what I know about your future, you should be doing the Roth 401k mm -hmm. because I I'm just making it up. But if you're in the 22% tax bracket and you're living in Texas, uh, you would be better off paying the taxes now mm -hmm. than deferring them. So the state that you live in, what your future inheritance looks like, yep. how you've set up retirement – it's not always just do tax deferral. Yeah. Uh, and I have seen a lot of folks doing it. I'm like, your tax bracket's definitely going to be higher in the future. And, and really the way I like to frame it is the Roth, you're raising your hand and saying, hey, Uncle Sam, I would like to pay my taxes now. Mm -hmm. The traditional, you're raising your hand and saying, hey, Uncle Sam, I'd like to pay my taxes later. 
you have to make the decision when taxes are lower for you. Mm -hmm. So again, I've given more Roth 401k advice than I probably ever have because I'm looking at, hey, this is what your future looks like, yep. inheritance, tax rates, things like that. So anyway, I'm just saying it's not a no-brainer. Yeah, yeah. and the other thing to consider is the amount of time. If you're talking to like a 30-something-year-old, that money's going to compound for 10, 20, 30, 40 years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and if it's a 30-year-old that you're like, hey, are you going to have a successful career? And they're like, yes. And I'm like, you're not in the highest tax bracket right, right. now. So if you think you're going to find yourself in the 37% bracket or 35% bracket, whatever, mm -hmm. um, but right now you're in 22, take that deal. Pay 22%. Yeah. Uh, it's a good deal for you. So yeah, that's, it, it should it should be it should be given some thought because I think in the past I've heard advisors and people like oh yeah you know you're max your four hundred one k out and I'm like yeah I don't know if I'd pump the taxes I'd mm -hmm. probably pay them now for some people definitely situational love that context and yeah as, as you retire you might have some investment income maybe some pension income social security income but after you retire you're probably in a lower bracket than you once were and so you might consider actually purposely paying some taxes in these years before things like uh, maybe you've delayed social security or before you're age 73 or 75 whenever your uh, required minimum distribution kicks in which will, might kick you into a higher tax bracket so yeah. and i touched on it a little bit but if in your mind you're moving to tennessee or you're moving to texas then yeah defer the taxes because mm -hmm. then you're going to move to a state where you're you're not going to pay those taxes unless California figures out a way to claw that back. Which I, don't, I don't see that. <laughs> yeah. Well, one more thing for the 60s too. I've noticed that uh, when people talk about doing Roth conversions, uh, moving money from their IRA to the Roth IRA per year, um, that's typically kind of a sweet spot where if they retire at 60, they're not taking Social Security until 67 or 70. Mm -hmm. There might be a, a handful of years that their income is lower mm -hmm. and that's kind of a good opportunity to do piece by piece. Yep. Yeah, their income's lower and maybe they spend down. I've had a lot of financial plans I've built where we've set aside a year's worth of cash and we're going to like, hey, spend this year's worth of cash this year. Mm -hmm. You're going to be a really low tax bracket and then do some Roth conversions. Mm -hmm. yep. And then sometimes I think you do, Blaine, where you even couple it with some uh, oversized uh, donor-advised fund contributions mm -hmm. uh, to kind of offset that. So yep. there's a lot of tax planning that can be done in those years. Yep, absolutely. So now we're onto the 70s and really, I guess I, I call them the golden years, 70s and beyond. And there's a couple age milestones right away that happen. Age 70 and a half, you can, if you're charitable, you can actually give money directly from your IRA to a charity and it's not counted as taxable income up to 105,000 a year. Trevor, we were looking at uh, a situation yesterday. Client has about $100,000 RMD every year. So that would be included on his tax return. They're very charitably inclined. And so they gave about 80,000 last year took it all out of their um, IRA. And so they only showed $20,000 of an IRA distribution on their tax return. Um, nuances, you know, this is, you know, education, not tax advice, but uh, something called qualified charitable distributions. That's what that's called. It can be very powerful for charitably minded individuals. Yeah, I met with a client yesterday and they were giving um, 15,000 a year but they had $15,000 a year of minimum distributions and they were not doing qualified charitable distributions. And I explained to them, again, it's not ideal for the podcast, but maybe it sparks a conversation. But I told them, the way you're giving, it's less than the standard deduction. So mm -hmm. you're, you're actually getting no benefit and you're paying taxes on your minimum distribution. Yep. It's literally, I, I did the math for him. It was saving him like $2,000, mm -hmm. but it was literally just a... a a changing in how he was recording things. Exactly. You know what I mean? So there are some low hanging fruit for tax savings. Yep. Obviously we always say there's no magic bullet, but there are some things that are unresourced that people could do and just changing the composition of how they do um, cash flow and things of that nature. Yeah. And we've mentioned a couple of times RMDs, required minimum distributions, what that is now. It used to be Or as clients like to call them MRDs, MRD, DRMs, there's all sorts of RDMs, <laughs> whatever. It is funny. Uh, it used to be 70 and a half. Again, I don't know why the half uh, birthday, but now for somebody in 2024, uh, either at age 73, 74, or 75, you're going to have to start pulling about 3.8%, let's call it 4% of your um, IRA balance and 401k balance. And so that's going to show up on your tax return unless you do these qualified charitable distributions. Um, so you can't do much about it once you get there. Hence the reason why we talk a lot about tax planning in your 60s before you get there. Um, 
Yeah, and you could be setting yourself up to pay more taxes, right? Like if if you have a three million dollar retirement account and it's going to spit out one hundred and four, one hundred twenty, one hundred fifty thousand dollars of minimum distributions or taxable income, and you're like, well, Trevor, I, I don't need that money. Like we're set, we're good with our other accounts. I'm like, what does it matter? Like you're required to take it. Basically, you raised your hand thirty years ago and said, yeah. Uncle Sam will pay it later. And uh, Uncle Sam, who is the mafia, showed up at your front door and they're <laughs> like, Hey. <laughs> pay up it's it's time to pay up so yeah. like you said the and Sean said too though the the 60s you know from 60 to now 73 those 13 years are so crucial mm-hmm. to do some tax planning and a lot of the planning we do is like hey you should probably do this over 13 years and people get cold feet and they're like oh, I don't know if I can commit to that I'm like you don't have to mm-hmm. you just do it every year and you can make the decision or change your mind at any time people hate the idea of paying taxes when they they technically don't have to, mm-hmm. but then when you show them like, if you model it out, it's actually a, a little bit unfair because it's like, well, it'll save you a million dollars of lifetime taxes. It is over doesn't feel real thirty years, but yeah. Uh, yeah, it can have a huge impact. Yeah. So in this latter stage of life, what specific planning items are you guys looking at? I like how you mentioned reviewing estate plan and beneficiaries. Um, I, I think that. Once you get to this point, things are probably slowing down. And I mean, you have more free time and not you're slowing down. But uh, I think it's kind of like I mentioned, it goes by fast when you're younger and raising kids. Like when you're working full time, maybe in your 50s and 60s, you're probably moving fast, moving fast, moving fast. And then next thing you know, you're in your 70s and hopefully you're still in good health. Now you have free time. That's when you want to make sure everything's buttoned up. Because when we talk about planning for something unexpected, the whole point of it is it was unexpected. You didn't Mm -hmm. see it coming. So if you are the one that manages the finances for the household, make sure there's a plan. Something happens Mm -hmm. to you. What's the plan? If something were to happen to you and your spouse, where's the money go? And Mm -hmm. you you mentioned a few examples, you know, if your goal is to have a pile of money, great. But if your goal is for that money to to go to other purposes, whether it's your children or your church or whatever's important to you, make sure that things are organized. Mm -hmm. Joe Klein does a great job of, of asking clients, um, where, how much money do you want to give each source? And then he says, your spouse, your children, charities, and the government. And whenever he says the government, clients kind <laughs> of chuckle. Government. Like, of course, I don't want to give the government any money. But it's a legitimate question because the way a lot of clients' estate plans are laid out, they might have to pay the government or their children would have to pay the government a nice sum of money. And mm-hmm. so there's often some planning you can do around that to avoid it. You two ever been to San Francisco? Yes. yes. Sean lived in the Bay Area. Walnut Creek. Yeah. Very hard. I took my driver's test in a stick shift car because my parents only had, what is that called? Manual transmission? Is that That's the right, right way to say it? And, did you uh, go on Lombard Street? No. <laughs> 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 I did go there on my wedding day. We uh, took a bunch of pictures there. That's the brick one, right? Yeah, the, 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 the winding one. one. Oh, yeah. Super yeah. Yeah. Yeah, hilly. Yeah, I got a bunch of pictures there. But uh, I remember driving in that like with a manual transmission, I had to use my emergency brake. Like I'd pull, you pull the emergency yeah. brake, you let the clutch out a little bit and then put it down because it's so hard. Mm-hmm. Uh, I also had a friend, uh, his parents lived there and we'd go. Imagine playing basketball there and it goes bounced off the rim. It starts going down one of those hills. You got to get that basketball quick because <laughs> there's at some point you just can't catch it anymore. And that, that vision of that basketball rolling down the hill because I've had it happen, uh, it reminds me a lot of clients are great savers because they get to a point where it's compounding and growing, where they can't spend as fast as their money's mm-hmm. growing. So I think the thing that we we underappreciate in our industry, we don't talk about enough, we deal with the one percenters. We deal with the people that have actually done a really good job saving, mm-hmm. that actually have abundance. And I, you put it in here a little bit, you said don't die with a pile of money. It, it's very similar to that basketball thing, is that if you don't have a plan, for how if you don't grab the basketball quickly, that, that thing's going to get away from you. And it's funny saying it that way because getting away from you means you have a whole lot of money. But I, I think there is some wisdom, even in your 40s or your 30s, of like, hey, what are some things that we want to do? And how can we do some of those things now versus punt those things all till I'm, I don't know, 75 mm-hmm. and uh, my limit limit of how much life I have left. And then I'm just like, whatever, you know, it all goes back to the box, but it's going to go to my kids. So again, I'm not articulating that perfectly, but I think a way to enjoy it with your kids during your lifetime is so crucial. 
I thought that was a really good illustration because yeah. I, I was kind of wondering where you're going with that. And then I'm, <laughs> I've had really it happen good. though. It's it's uh, it's it's a goner after a while. Like if you you can imagine, <laughs> what do you do? You're just like, oh, we'll get it tomorrow. <laughs> no, you get, another, you get another <laughs> basketball. Lose, lose yeah, because like you run and you know, like when you're running downhill, yeah. your legs start to get away yeah. from you. If you're not close to grabbing it, you're like. I'm done. Yeah. Momentum, inertia, whatever. That, that happens with my are. kids, but not on a hill. It's just a flat surface. <laughs> and they'll, they'll reach down, and then the ball's two feet in front of them. Then they'll run, reach down, the ball's still two feet in front of them. Yeah. So, I mean, that's that's what it feels like for clients. That's that's the greatest learning. Uh, I don't know how long I've been doing this career, decade or something, but uh, that's my greatest learning as of recent where I'm like, oh, no. Like, I'm just thinking of a client off the top of my head. You have $20 million. This year, you're going to get $800,000 in dividends, and you live a lifestyle where you spend 300000 And on top of those dividends, historically, for this particular client, you've been grabbing an extra 4% appreciation. So this thing's growing at 8% on $20 million, $1.6 million. You're spending 300000 mm-hmm. That's snowball effect. Mm-hmm. And then I'm not telling them, like, just go buy a yacht. I don't know, but because... Again, I'm not critiquing, but because nobody's ever poked and prodded and said like, "Hey, what can you do with this?" Um, and I, I, again, I'm not going to bring up a, a whole other topic, but just throwing it all at charity too. It, I'm I'm a treasurer at the church. It's it's hard sometimes when you get a big lump sum where where we haven't earmarked it. So. I think some planning around how you do that over a lifetime is is super helpful before that basketball gets too far away from you. Love that. Anything else in these latter years? Latimer years? Latimer years. YOLO. <laughs> <laughs> Tomorrow's not guaranteed. Enjoy life. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I brought this book up last time. A client recommended uh, reading this book, Die With Zero. Uh-huh. And there's so much I didn't like about the book, but so much of what he said has kind of stuck with me because... I like this. I like when people do this. He's he's preaching something nobody else is preaching. Mm-hmm. Um, and he, he has this idea of memory dividends. And he's like, the way memory dividends work is they also compound. So something that you do in your 30s, if you're going to live till you're 80, that memory gets to compound for 50 years. You know, he, Never heard that concept. He, he talks about uh, how his dad got to a place where uh, he's kind of isolated at home and he couldn't, he couldn't move very much anymore. So he bought him an iPad. And they loaded on the iPad a bunch of old football games from, I think, Cornell or wherever his dad played. And his dad would just sit there and watch him, like, single tier. And it was just like, because he obviously couldn't play football, but he just got to bask in those memories. Mm -hmm. So there is something to be said. I'll give that author a little credit Mm -hmm. that we live in a world where people say, squirrel away as much money as you can, save, save, save. Like, the end is coming, the sky is falling. But most of the clients we deal with, they're going to leave their kiddos their heirs their charities a lot of wealth mm-hmm. is this the book you didn't want to recommend to me because you thought i might fall victim to a yeah i did not <laughs> want to recommend it to you i did not want to recommend it i already to have you. the live in the moment kind of personality so yeah i, I could see that <laughs> no it was it was just an interesting concept again i would love to grab lunch with the guy because there's some things he says i'm like oh that's just not good advice you know what i mean but conceptually in a world where everybody's preaching one thing mm-hmm. and he goes the polar opposite I think it's good to find the tension yeah. uh, of how you do those things. So, And really if good. you're not a good saver, don't find this book and be like, see? <laughs> <laughs> Justify your lifestyle. Exactly. <laughs> um, well, we went through a lot of different age milestones and strategies throughout the years. I will say there's a lot more to unpack. We're talking about QCDs and RMDs and FRAs. It's an alphabet soup. So, LOL. LOL, (laughs) R-O-F-L. So please email us, you know, connect with us if you want to learn more about any of these topics. We're happy uh, to chat with you. And any final thoughts for you guys? Nope. I'll just piggyback on what you said. Like these articles uh, are meant to be whatever, 1,200 words. They're meant to be sparks, right? Mm -hmm. They're meant to spark and start uh, an idea fire in your own head. So I would encourage people, just like you said, you can email us, Tom, T-O-M, at thebondsgroup.com. Address it to Blaine, Trevor, Sean. Uh, there's a lot of things when I read this, it was a reminder for me. I got my pencil and mm-hmm. paper and kind of wrote down some notes. I know even at the beginning of each year, I have to remind myself because I'm like, okay, I'm going to max out my HSA. I'm going to add a little to the 529 plans. I'm going to max out my 401k. I'm going to do some backdoor Roth. And sometimes 
uh, Darren, one of our coworkers, helps me with a lot of this stuff, the execution of it. I'm like, did I do that this year? Because there's there's like a lot of moving parts. A lot of moving parts, yeah. So having a recorded place of like, oh, where am I on the timeline right now? I thought was quite helpful. So good idea. Yeah. Hey, thank you. I liked it. Good job. Yeah. Appreciate it, Sean. Great work, boy. <laughs> um, so with that said, we'll ask that you rate the podcast. Obviously, five stars are preferred. Um, do you guys always give your Uber driver five stars? Not always. Not always. If wait, he deserves it, but are you, I, I wait, wait, nothing are, in between. Yeah, I five or one, right? I, yeah, <laughs> I, I think it's like if it was a bad experience. Oh, I'm for sure gonna put a one. But if it's good, everyone gets five. Yeah. Are you twenty percent every time for a tip? Whatever the easiest. They, they're really smart the way they make the buttons. I think whatever the easiest first one I see is. Yeah, I I I could go to a restaurant and they could give bad service. I just feel bad. It's like 20%. <laughs> it's like it's just a default. I don't ever do more. I don't ever do less. It's just a default. So there you go. But hey, five stars are preferred if uh, you enjoyed the podcast. Um, and of course, we'll be back next week with more of our Thoughts, thoughts on, on Money. money.